Well, I would invite you to take your Bibles now and open them up to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Does anybody have a favorite Bible verse? You know, it just seems like there's just so many good ones to pick from. Uh, John Wesley's favorite Bible verse was Zechariah 3, 2. This one's kind of interesting. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? I don't think that's mine. Uh, John Newton, uh, he was a former slave trader who wrote Amazing Grace. His favorite verse was Romans 5, 20. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Martin Luther had Romans 1, 17 as his life text, the righteous will live by faith. And so each of these verses spoke to these men in their particular condition, their life, and it became for them the greatest text in the whole Bible. But the verse that we come to now, it's everyone's text. There, there is hardly a place in the world where the gospel has gone that this verse has not become almost instantly known. It is the first verse that translators will put into another language. Millions of people have been taught to recite this verse. It is inscribed on books, on buildings, it's reflected in songs, and I am talking about John 3.16. Let's recite this together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Karl Barth, he was a famous elite world theologian last century and he was asked one time at the end of a series of lectures, somebody asked him, what is the greatest thought that ever passed through your mind, this eminent scholar? And Karl Barth paused for a long time, thought about the answer, and he finally just kind of raised up his head, his head and he said with grace and childlike simplicity, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I'll tell you, it is that truth. That if you are a Christian, and Christians of any age, you've loved that truth. You have embraced that truth. And I just want to look this morning at God's love in this, our first study of John 3.16. Because I think there are six, six things in this verse that tell us about the love of God. And so the first, the first thing is what I call the tense of God's love. For God so loved. It's not just that God loves, but he, he loved. Now, if you are born again, you can understand at least a little bit that God loves you now that you're his child. Really what is almost incomprehensible, though, is that he loved us before we became his children. One of my favorite Bible verses is Romans 5.8. Here it is. God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God doesn't just love you, present tense, based on your current performance. God loved you, past tense, based on nothing inherently lovely in you, based only on his gracious love for you. But the tense of God's love does not exhaust his love, obviously. So secondly, we see in John 3, 16, the magnitude of God's love, the magnitude for God so loved, and no one has ever been able to define or measure that little word, so. The Apostle Paul made an attempt. Here's what he prayed in Ephesians 3. He prayed that Christians may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And he's just going on and on. And these glorious words here speak to the infinite nature of God's love. In other words, it's inexhaustible. These dimensions that Paul said, breadth, length, height, depth, those things are impossible to measure. And that makes me remember, I remember in school learning fractions. Raise your hand if you love fractions. Does anybody miss fractions? You know, wow, Tammy, like, you know, I think Janie is shaking her neck, me and you, yeah. So here's what I remember about fractions. I remember hating them. But I also remember my teacher's illustration to help us understand fractions. And this will come back to the magnitude of God's love, I promise you. Our teacher said, imagine a football team and they are on their opponent's one-yard line. One-yard line. They're about to score a touchdown. But the defense commits a five-yard penalty. Well, there aren't five yards of field available to assess a five-yard penalty, right? So the referee, by rule, assesses the penalty with what? 
a fraction. What's it called? Half the distance to the goal line. Half, right? So the referee places the ball on the one half yard line. But the defensive lineman, a defensive lineman, jumps across the line of scrimmage too early on the next play. The referee throws the flag and assesses a five yard penalty. But again, there's just a half of a yard of the field available. So he moves the ball again by rule half the distance to the goal line. So now the ball is placed halfway between the half yard line and the end zone. It's on the quarter yard line. Do you see the fraction part of this? So my math teacher said, if the stupid defense keeps committing penalties, the ball will inch closer and closer and closer to a touchdown, but it will never actually cross the end zone ever, ever. Because in the world of fractions, you can get infinitely close, infinitely close to a touchdown without ever fully scoring because half of something is always leaving something more. That's fractions. And so I thought about that, and in many ways, that's really the best that we can ever get to measuring and realizing the magnitude of God's love for sinners like you and me. The more you come to know and experience the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love, the more you realize that you have barely tapped into the magnitude of God's love for sinners such as us. You know, when my kids say to my mom, Mimi, I love you. My mom always says, I love you more, as only a grandparent or a parent can say. You know, it's that more part of God's love that is just absolutely wonderful. But it's not just the tense and the magnitude of God's love that inform us. Third, John 3, 16 also tells us of the scope of God's love. The scope of it. For God so loved the world. So God's love is not limited to that narrow little strip of land that is called Israel to this day. His love flowed out to sinners among what the Bible calls Gentiles. That's just the rest of us. If you don't have Jewish blood pumping through your veins, you are a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. You're, I don't even really know exactly what kind of blood flows through me, but it's Gentile blood. It's just a mixture. It's non-Jewish. And God has always been a missionary God. But it's easy to get confused about this when you open up the Old Testament of our Bible and we begin to read, because we begin to read things like God ratifying a covenant only with Israel, way up on Mount Sinai, through Moses and those Ten Commandments. And then we read of all the hundreds of the laws and the rituals and the ceremonies that flow out of that covenant on Mount Sinai, what's called the covenant of works, because it's all based on works. Here's basically that covenant. God said to Israel, obey it and I'll bless you. Disobey it and I will curse you. And it's a two-way covenant. God will do certain things based on whether Israel does or does not do their certain things. And Israel, as we know, read the story, they failed almost every single time. But the point here is that that Sinaitic covenant was all about the nation of Israel, not the world, not us Gentiles. And so we Gentiles read all of those Old Testament passages today that are intended for Israel. And, and I think we're hit with a bunch of questions. One would just be, well... Does God love Israel more than he loves us Gentiles today? Another one, is our salvation based on our own performance? Because I read about all those rules that they had to obey to be blessed, and, and then I read about all the cursings that would come upon them if they disobey. We also wonder, well, was God unloving to the Gentile world? Because we see that he commanded his people, Israel, to stay away from all those unclean, dirty, filthy, sinful Gentiles. In fact, he even called his people, Israel, go destroy some of those Gentiles sometimes in a holy war, a bloody holy war. And we get, we get all tangled up with these questions when we read the Bible without understanding. And so let me just try to simplify the scope of God's love. That's what I'm talking about here, the scope of it. So God's covenant with Israel at Sinai. That was specifically for Israel, for a specific purpose. Namely, that Israel would become the holy nation through whom the Savior of the whole world would come. There's the real purpose right there. Because what is Jesus? Is he a Gentile? Well, Jesus is a Jew. He came from within Israel. So this whole covenant that God set up with them was so that Israel would be a set-apart protected, holy nation, so that Christ the Lord would come from them. And then, as you know, we turn to the New Testament in the fullness of time. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he fulfilled Israel's entire purpose for existence. That's what he did. He, 
he therefore rendered null and void that old covenant of works that God ratified with Israel on Mount Sinai. In fact, Christ is the true Israel. Where Israel failed, Christ succeeded every time. And now we come back to the missionary love of God for the world. Because long before God ratified that covenant of works, long before there was an Israel to give birth to the Savior of the world, God entered into a very different covenant with a guy by the name of Abram. And Abram at that point in time was just some dude from what is modern day Iraq. Nothing special about him. And that covenant was very different. In fact, it's a, it's a covenant of grace. And there was only one party required to do anything in that covenant. And that was God. If you read that covenant that God established with Abraham, you constantly see God saying, I, 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 I will do this, and I will do that, and I will do this, and I will do that. There are never any stipulations for the lesser party, who is Abraham, ever. So this one's different. God required nothing of Abraham, and he required everything of himself, the greater party. Let me just read you a part of God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis 12, 2. God says, I will make of you a great nation. That, there's that reference to Israel. I mean, this is hundreds of years before there even is a Moses, before there is, even is a children of Israel, before there is, is even that, that covenant on Sinai. Hundreds of years before that, but Abraham fathered that nation, that is Israel. And then God continues with the covenant of grace. He says, and in you, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, from Abraham's seed, from Israel, referring specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is just saying that the Savior who would come from the loins of Abraham, come from within the womb of Israel, that Savior will bless the entire world. I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care where you're from. Maybe you don't even know your family history. It's, it's irrelevant because Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And so this covenant, this one that God ratified with Abraham, it predates, it rides above, it extends beyond the nation of Israel. Israel's, Israel's role is now done. It's fulfilled. It's complete. It's null and void. And so this covenant with Abraham that I'm just really talking a lot about here, obviously, this covenant of grace had an audience, had a scope that is what? The world. The entire world. And we read it in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And I tell you, church, God is a missionary God. He always has been. He loves the world so much that he sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And I just simply say, you are included in that. You are. You are. Fourth, it's not just the tense, magnitude, and scope of God's love that we see here. John 3, 16 also tells us of the sacrificial nature of God's love. Sacrificial nature for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we're obviously now touching on God's gift of his son. I'm going to preach an entire sermon in the coming days on God's gift. But for now, I just want to highlight that the gift reveals the sacrificial nature of God's love. Love's an interesting word. You've heard before that the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, has multiple words for love. We just have this one. But I just want to tell you, God doesn't love you the way you love your dog. Does anybody love your dog? Our dog's fourth birthday was yesterday, and we brought him in before he went to bed and loved on him a little bit. We love our dog, kind of. He's kind of a knucklehead. He's hard to love at times. But, but God doesn't love you the way you love your dog. You love your dog. Um, God also doesn't love you the way you love your favorite sports teams. Anybody in here a sports fanatic? Some people are, you know, you love. And, and well, God doesn't love you just like that, does he? Neither does he love you the way you love your best friend. Does anybody have a best friend? Well, don't raise your hand, but, you know, you love them, right? Well, God doesn't love you exactly like that. Neither does he love you the way you love your spouse and your children. It goes much deeper because God's agape love. And you've no doubt heard of that, agape love. Agape love is the highest purest, most intense love that is capable of being expressed in the Greek language. And I just want to tell you that God loves you, fellow sinner, with such a pure, intense, emotional love that, get this, that he killed his son for you. That kind of love. That kind of love. That is the sacrificial nature of his love. His his costly, love-induced 
blood-saturated gift. It's a gift. And to think that so many preachers today soil God's agape, blood-wrought gift by turning it into just easy believism, to think that they reduce it to a formula for getting what we want, to think that they cheapen it by term, turning it into just self-help psychology. The, the audacity of people to turn God's sacrificial gift of His Son into whatever they want it to be. Fifth, it is not just the tense and the magnitude and the scope or the sacrificial nature of God's love that informs us about His love. John 3.16 also tells us of the design of God's love, the design. That whoever believes in Him should not perish. You remember last Sunday's passage? You can just look at your Bible right before it. You remember many of the Israelites who were bitten by the fiery serpents in the wilderness died. Many of them. Not everyone, not everyone was able to look up at the bronze serpent that God had told Moses to lift up on that pole, to look at it and to believe that God is crazy as it sounded. Look at that, you snake bit victims. And if you'll look at that one and believe me, God says, I'll heal you. Not everybody had a chance to do that. Many, many of them died. And many, many of Adam and Eve's descendants, like us to this day, will suffer eternal death in the fire of hell. But God decided to set his love on a people who should not perish. And who this particular people are is made manifest by their believing in God's Son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. Now here's what's interesting. Many, many people today question the legitimacy of God's love because he doesn't save everyone. Oh, he doesn't save everyone, they say. And the Bible's response to that accusation, it is always shocking to our modern sensibilities and our modern championing of equal rights. Let me just read one place where the Bible responds to that skeptical accusation, Romans 9. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? In other words, you have the audacity to open up your mouth and to, to accuse God of anything? Let me continue. Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? This language obviously does not sit well in our age of individual rights, our age that demands social justice and fairness. Here's what's interesting, though. These high-minded people who accuse God of being unloving and unjust, let's face it, they should take a look in the mirror. Because the very social justice warriors who demand, for instance, that a woman has a right to abortion, because her body is her body, well, guess what they do? They conveniently mention, or they conveniently never mention, the rights of the baby who is killed. Let me just ask you, who's speaking up for the baby's rights here? Out there in America. Is there anybody out there speaking up for the baby's rights? All these people who are saying that God's unjust and unfair? Let me go on. The social justice warriors today who, who demand that boys who identify as girls have the right to compete on girls' sports teams. Right? Oh, they conveniently stay silent when it comes to the rights of the girls who are already playing on those teams. I mean, let me ask you, who speaks up for the girls who now have to compete against a physical specimen who by God's design is bigger, stronger, and faster than they are? Let me go on. Social justice warriors demand the right not just to peacefully demonstrate in public, but to loot and destroy public property, even to resort to violence to get their point across. Oh, but they conveniently stay silent about the rights of the people who are on the receiving end of all their violent protests. Let me just ask you, who speaks up for the business owners who get their businesses trashed in the vandalism? Who speaks up for the innocent bystander just out on the street who gets knocked in the head by one of the social justice warriors because they don't look woke enough? Let me go on. Social justice warriors are pushing critical race theory curriculum off on public schools. Happening right now all across America. This thing called critical race theory. And they are replacing reading, writing, and arithmetic with classes that make young white kids feel guilty for being white. And make kids of color feel justified in treating white kids bad. 
And right on hypocritical cue, the proponents of critical race theory conveniently ignore the victims. And the victims are many. And this one, obviously the white kids who are going to be confused, it's like, well, I'm white. I mean, does that mean my mommy and daddy are bad? Was grandpa and grandma bad? So it's going to make the white kids confused and mistreated. But it's also unfair to the victims who would be the kids of color because they will be further indoctrinated into this victim mentality. But it will also create victims of just all the kids who are going to be robbed of a real education, real knowledge that translates into real jobs. Oh, there's another victim, America at large. Because if we let this happen, guess what? We're going to get stupider and stupider and stupider. Let me tell you, meanwhile, China, China is teaching its kids hard stuff. Hard stuff that translates into smart, well-trained employees who will go out into the world place of, mar of the market and take control of it. And that's where we're getting ourselves. I think you get the point. The people who accuse God of being unjust and unloving, they are hypocritical to the hilt. And in their arrogant, dishonest pride, they fail to acknowledge this simple truth. God is God. And he doesn't owe you me or anyone anything he doesn't owe us a word no explanation no answer i like what j vernon mcgee says he says this is god's universe and he does things his way you may think you have a better way but you don't have a universe don't you like that <laughs> it's good stuff isn't it but here's the thing all the people who think they have a better way they fail to reckon with the fact get this no one receives an injustice from God. No one receives injustice from God. Here's what I mean. God's ironclad law is that every person who sins will be punished for eternity in hell. That's, there is, that's the gospel law. It starts off with that. Ironclad. Every sinner will go to hell for all of eternity. And it goes a little bit further. Every person, every person is a sinner. Therefore, every sinner deserves what? To go to hell. Deserves to. That's what you deserve, sinner. That's what I deserve, sinner. So on judgment day, no one whom King Jesus cast into eternal hell, no one will receive an injustice. Do you get that? All sinners on that day will receive perfect justice. Exactly what they earned. Exactly what they deserve. Now here's the thing we don't understand. And we never will is why in the world did God decide to show love to any of us sinners? We don't know. The Bible never tells us. But he did. But he did, which is why John 3.16 is embraced and quoted and memorized and loved by sinful Christians who've now been saved in every era, everywhere that the gospel has ever gone. The design of God's love is that whoever believes in him, that is Jesus Christ, should not perish. And so anyone who believes, they won't receive justice on judgment day. Because if they receive justice, if you sinner receive justice, what you justly deserve, where would you spend eternity? In hell. Let me tell you, I don't want God to be just with me. I don't want him to treat me with fairness because what I fairly and justly deserve is to be cast into hell. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will not receive justice. They will receive something called mercy. And let me tell you, if you don't know that word, man, wrap yourself up in it. Mercy. The very thing you don't deserve. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will receive mercy and grace. Back to that covenant of grace that is for the world. Grace. You're going to get what you did not deserve. You're going to get what you did not deserve. Earn. That's grace. No one gets a raw deal from God. That's no one. No one gets a raw deal from God. Most people will receive perfect justice, exactly what they asked for, exactly what they deserve. And those who believe in Jesus Christ will receive mercy and grace. And I hope you are included in the second group. Well, sixth and finally, it's not just the tense and the magnitude and the scope and the sacrificial nature or the design of God's love that tells us about his love. John 3.16 also tells us of the duration of God's love. The duration. But have everlasting life. And I think this is probably the greatest aspect of God's love. I mean, the heart of the matter is that God loves in such a way that nothing you do, nothing I do, nothing we ever will do can alter the fact that he loves you. 
God's love for his children is unchangeable. It goes on forever. And really this point is illustrated, I think, by one of the greatest stories in the Bible. This is the story of Hosea and his unfaithful wife, Gomer. Maybe you haven't heard it in a while. Maybe you never read it. One day the Lord came and, and he said to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to marry a woman who is going to prove unfaithful to you. How would you like to start out your marriage with that? She's going to tell you right now, as you say I do, uh, she's going to cheat on you several times. <laughs> yeah, she definitely deserves a giggle, you know. But that's what God told Hosea. And this is real, right? And God says, now you're going to love her, but she's going to turn away from your love. Nevertheless, he says, the more faithless she becomes, the more faithful and loving that I want you to be. And I want you to do this because I want to give Israel an illustration of how much I love them. Your marriage, he says, will be a pageant. He said, you're going to play God and the woman's going to play the part of Israel. I love Israel, he says. I'm doing this because I love Israel with an unchangeable love. And she runs away from me and takes other gods as her lovers. So Hosea did exactly as God told him. And so we read from the book of Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom. And we don't use that word much of anybody, but that's a good one. A wife of whoredom. <laughs> You know, we have other words, but we you could say what we got from that one. A wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. Uh, that just means they weren't his. You know, who's your daddy? You know, and that's what was going on. <laughs> that's called Pastor Todd's version of Hosea. For the land commits great whoredom. Even the land's in this thing. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. So let me interrupt. So. At this point in the story, God intervened because he had told Hosea that I'm going to order each stage of this relationship between you and Gomer. And so God intervened at this point and he gave a name to that first son and God said, call his name Jezreel. Jezreel means scattered because God was going to scatter the people of Israel all over the face of the earth. He was so angry with them for turning their backs on him. Well, after a time, Gomer conceived again, probably with another guy, and she bore a daughter Call her name Lo Ruhama, God said. Lo Ruhama means no mercy. And God was saying, The time's going to come when I will no longer show love and mercy to the house of Israel. Finally, another son was born, probably from another daddy. And Hosea was told to call him Lo Ami. Lo Ami means not my people. For said God, You are not my people, and I am not your God. Well, this is interesting. If the story stopped right here, then the ending would be terrible. And, and the pageant would illustrate the opposite of the unchangeable, eternal love of God for his people. But the story doesn't stop here. Because God intervenes and he tells how the story is going to end. He says, I am going to change the names of those children. I'm going to change Jezreel to Jezreel. Well, that's the same word, but in Hebrew it's got a second meaning. And it's a change from scattered to planted. Because in the ancient world, when a man was going to throw something away, it's the same gesture by which he would plant seeds. I'm going to throw it away, but I'm also going to plant my seeds in the ground. And so God was promising to plant the people of Israel once again in their homeland. Moreover, said God, I'm going to change Lo Ruhama to Ruhama. And Lo Ami to Ami. Because the time is coming, says God, when I'm going to show mercy to my children. The Bible says, Hosea 1.10, In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. And so the time came in the marriage when the events that God foretold just happened exactly. Uh, Gomer looked around, caught the eye of some stranger, and before long, man, she was gone. I mean, Hosea is just all alone at home. And you know the life of a woman like that? We still read the sad stories of women like that. That life goes downhill pretty fast. I mean, if Gomer left Hosea for a man who'd get, who could give her a Mercedes and a fur coat this year, I'm modernizing it, well, it is equally certain that the following year when that first lover gets tired of her, she's going to be found with a man who can only give her a fur-lined collar and a Buick. The year after that, she's going to be in fake fur and a Hyundai. Don't get mad at me if you drive a Hyundai. <laughs> And the year after that, she's going to be pulling something out of the garbage heap. And so it was with Hosea's wife. This was Gomer's life. The time came when she's now living with a man who doesn't even have the means to take care of her. In fact, she is hungry. He can't even feed her. 
And now, God said to Hosea, I want you to go. And I want you to see that she gets the things that she needs. Because I take care of my people. Even when they are running away from me. And so Hosea went and he bought the groceries. And he gave them to the man she was living with. Gomer didn't even know that he was the one that did it. The story tells us, she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Let me just stop and ask. Does God love like that? I want to tell you, yes, he does. Have you ever run away from God? Yes, you have, and I have too. What happened? God paid your bills. That's what he did. If you have been running away from God, do you realize that God is the one that gave you the strength to even run? Your pudgy little legs or skinny little legs or whatever your legs are like, he's the one who gave them to you. He's the one that gave you the end. You're the one running, and he's the one that gave you the strength to do that. And I'll tell you, you can run, but God pursues you if you are his child. He pursues you with his love. Well, the final act of the the drama is approaching, and so the time came when when Gomer sank so low that she was just sold as a slave in the city of Jerusalem. And and God told Hosea to go and buy her. Now, you need to know that slaves in that world were sold naked, just one of the most humiliating things. And so when a beautiful woman like Gomer was on sale, well, the men began to bid pretty freely, and the bidding always went high. So here's Gomer. Her clothes are taken off of her, and the bidding starts. One man bids three pieces of silver. That's a lot. Another says five, ten, twelve, thirteen. Well, then these lower bidders drop out when Hosea says fifteen pieces of silver. Well, then there's a voice from the back of the crowd that says fifteen pieces of silver and a bushel of barley. That's worth something then. Fifteen pieces of silver and a bushel and a half of barley says Hosea. And the auctioneer looks around. I mean, is anybody going to bid higher? And seeing that no one does, he declares, this slave is sold to Hosea for 15 pieces of silver and a bushel and a half of barley. And Hosea took his wife, whom he now owned, and he put her clothes on her and, and he led her away from that gawking crowd. And you say, is that really a true picture of God's love? Yes, it is. And that is how God loves you. It's how he loves you. Listen to what the Bible says about it. Hosea 3, the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days, and you shall not play the whore. Or belong to another man, and I will live with you. And so here in living color really is the the unchangeable, eternal love of Almighty God. God loves you and me like that. Because let's face it, we are the slave. The Bible tells us that we live in bondage to sin. We came into the world of sinners. We can't stop it. We can't do anything about it. In fact, at our worst, we love it. We jump into it like a pig jumps into mud. We are slaves to sin. We are the one placed upon the world's auction block. And the bidding of the world for us, and who controls this world? The devil does. The bidding of the world just goes higher and higher and higher. And there we are in all of our humiliation. And at some point, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful bridegroom, he enters the slave market of sin, and he bids a price. He bids a price. And what, ladies and gentlemen, is the price that the Lord Jesus Christ would bid for you, sinner, and me, sinner? How about the price of his own blood? He said, I'll give my life. And sold, says the auctioneer, who is almighty God, sold to Jesus Christ for the price of his blood. And you say, well, what does that have to do with me, Pastor Todd? It has everything to do with you. Are you one who has never known that love? Never realized that Jesus Christ loved you like that? I mean, to be touched with that kind of love is to throw yourself at his feet in adoration. Just to marvel that you ever, ever could have violated such compassion. 
And so I just ask you, will, he, will you allow the hardness of your heart to melt before God's love, just to allow Jesus Christ to become your great Savior, your bridegroom? Or, or perhaps you're one who, you've already done that. You say, Pastor, I did all that. You believed in Christ. But the reality of that love has just become distant to you. It's just, it's just far from you. And you need to hear that God's love is unchangeable. It, it is eternal. You need to hear that God takes you back. Simply because of his great eternal love for you. Not through anything in you. He chases you down just like Hosea chased Gomer. Well, finally, maybe you believe in Christ, but you've never really realized that the love of Christ is to become the pattern of your life. He is to be your model. And so you need to ask yourself whether your love has any of the character at all of God's love, whether it is a giving love, whether it is unchangeable, all those things we've looked at. In fact, ask it right now. Does your love change when the person you love doesn't respond quickly enough according to your time frame? Does your love hold firm another way, other, uh, another way of saying it? Or let me ask you, do, do you continue to love when your wife or your husband, your child or your friend doesn't seem to see things the way that you do? They contradict you. Do you love as Christ does? Because you and I are called to show forth that kind of love. Because when other people see that, guess what? They see that's not right. That's not right. That's strange. That's a love like I have never understood. It's, it's not conditional. And when the world sees that, they begin to be attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will show love to them. Would you please stand to your feet, and bow your heads, close your eyes. God, we just simply say, as we come to the end of this, this sermon, the end of this worship service, we just want to say thank you for your love. Thank you for your love gift, your son, your only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but should have everlasting life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.